Hi everyone, we're going to read a little bit of Plato today. And before we get started, this is from Phaedrus, the dialogue Phaedrus that I teach in many of uh, taught for many years in my rhetoric course. Um, and this is the Benjamin uh, Jowett or Jowett translation, which is widely available. You can find it on the MIT archives. You can find it floating around the internet. Uh, late 1800s translation, and I'm just reading from a printed version here. But again, before we get started, I think one of the best things you can do if you're interested in ancient Greek rhetoric, ancient Greek philosophy, ancient Greek thinkers is just go ahead and read it. Don't be afraid of Plato. Don't be afraid of Aristotle. Just jump in and give it a shot and do some triangulation of your knowledge, read a couple Wikipedia articles and read your sources from whatever classes you're taking or, um, you know, watch some videos online. That's great. Get some foundational background knowledge, but then dig into the text itself. That's the intention that go to the source, right? And, and same thing, if you're writing about Plato, you're writing about Aristotle, use textual evidence, go right to the text. You, you can do it. I know you can do it. Um, practice and, and go slowly through them. So that's what we'll do here. I'm going to look at a, a major theme from Phaedrus, which is on the limitations of writing. And there's a very clever thing here happening where Plato has Socrates sort of create this myth about how writing came to be. And then Socrates goes on to critique writing, uh, writing as a technology. Well, let's jump in. So Socrates says near, near the end of the dialogue, Phaedrus, I don't have Stephanus numbers here, I'm sorry, but Socrates says, at the Egyptian city of Nocritus, there was a famous old god whose name was Thuth. The bird which is called the Ibis is sacred to him, and he was the inventor of many arts, such as arithmetic and calculation and geometry and astronomy and dice, but his great discovery was the use of letters. Now in those days the god Thamus was the king of the whole country of Egypt, and he dwelt in that great city of Upper Egypt which the Hellens call Egyptian Thebes, and the god himself is called by them Ammon. To him came Thuth and showed his inventions, desiring that the other Egyptians might be followed to have the benefit of them. He enumerated them, and Thamus inquired about their several uses, and praised some of them, and censured others, as he approved or disapproved of them. It would take a long time to repeat all that Thamus said to Thuth in praise or blame of the various arts, but when they came to letters, This, said Thuth, will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. It is a specific both for the memory and for the wit. Thamus replied, O most ingenious Thuth, the parent or inventor of an art is not always the best judge of the utility or inutility of his own inventions to the users of them. And in this instance, you who are the father of letters, from a paternal love of your own children, have been led to attribute to them a quality which they cannot have. For this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls, because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written characters and not remember of themselves. The specific which you have discovered is an aid not to memory, but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. And then Phaedrus says, quite comically, Yes, Socrates, you can easily invent tales of Egypt or of any other country. But I love this. There's so many things I love about this. Um, one of the first things is this idea of the inventor of letters, the inventor of writing, thinking of language as his children, which is something I talk to my students sometimes about in writing courses. It's like we have this very strong attachment to what we write. And that can be 
sometimes dangerous because in a in the stage of revision we always write with a process right you create a draft then you revise it then you edit it um, you know then you proofread it and then often you get towards something like a final work that's that's publishable or ready to submit for a class or what have you but a, a lot of students find it really difficult deleting their own sentences, revising their own work. That's it's my babies. These are my ideas that I have on the page, and it's sometimes difficult. So we see that back, you know, two thousand four hundred, two thousand three hundred years ago in in Socrates's conception of language. But the critiques here, and then Socrates goes on to discuss them in more detail, are are pretty interesting because they're. Th they're thinking about writing as a kind of technology, which it is. And we, we see some contemporary sources on that too, like uh, Walter Ong, writing as a technology that restructures thought. And for the ancient Greeks, writing would have been something fairly new. Uh, it, it certainly would have been like, today everyone has a laptop or a smartphone and you can just open up a word document and you can write whatever you want you know there are um there are restrictions to the medium papyri is expensive and and hard to come by um you know and, and not everyone would have access to this and it's also a, a fairly new technology right um and the ancient greeks have have a strong connection a strong cultural heritage around the spoken word, the oral tradition. So it's here that you see those two things clashing. Also, and perhaps more importantly, is, is Plato's philosophy here, that there's something about the dialectic, the, the dialogic process of conversation, of real active speech that is linked to the discovery of wisdom, the discovery of truth. Aristotle reverses that and says something like, the dialectic is the process whereby we discover what we don't know. But Plato seems to place a lot of significance. You see it even in the way that he writes. He structures, uh, he structures his writing in the form of a dialogue, in the form of a conversation between people. Uh, because Plato seems to think that it's through this process, through this interaction, this kind of Socratic method of questioning and digging and prodding and poking, you know, what do you mean by justice? You say you, you, say you aim toward justice, what do you mean by justice? And then what do you mean by that definition you provided? And this kind of constant digging and prodding. Um, through that process that we get towards something like truth. And Plato says that writing can't do that. And we may disagree with this, and there's certainly good cases, but we're just thinking about what Plato has put down on the page here through Socrates. Um, it seems that for, you know, Socrates is saying here that, well, he, late, later on a couple, you know, go down a few lines and you see this description of writing like painting. It's static. It can't have a conversation with you. Once you put it down, it's there. It's just like that uh, and will stay like that. Now, we have different ideas today. I mean, writing is a way to, writing as a kind of magic as far as I'm concerned, that it, you, know, you can speak across time and have, in, in a sense, conversations with individuals who no longer exist. They've long since died. Um, you know, we see a lot of contemporary ideas like this. The book is like a portal into another world or something like that. And that's certainly true, but it, it doesn't diminish, I don't think, the critiques that Plato is making is that, you know, even neuroscientifically, I think there's a case where, or this new Google phenomenon, where it seems like humans remember um, when, when they have access to search engines, they remember how to find information more easily than they commit the actual information to their memory. And Socrates here is talking about a kind of forgetfulness, um, a, a way that writing is just a shadow of truth, a shadow of reality, and that you need to embody your knowledge, you need to have these ideas, you must discover these truths within yourself, which then relates to that major theme of truth and rhetoric as it appears throughout the entire dialogue. That 
philosophy has a particular method and philosophy is how you discover truth and you must first be a philosopher before you can be a rhetorician or else you'll have a bad harvest of rhetoric and that's demonstrated through you know the contemporary example of like a hitler or something like that great speaker but ethically deprived right that seems to be Plato's case in, in Phaedrus, is that you first must deeply think upon the subject upon which you are going to speak or write, for that matter. Uh, you must first deeply consider, philosophically consider, what it is that you're saying. First be a philosopher, then employ the art of rhetoric, and those two things must be coupled together. So... That's something interesting to look for in Phaedrus for you. Just wanted to read a little bit of Plato and, and kind of break down this, this theme of writing. And there's a lot more there to unpack, but just that interesting, the myth of Thuth and the invention of writing and Plato's uh, interesting skepticism of writing as a technology. You can find that all over the internet. Phaedrus is one of my favorite of the Platonic dialogues. And the limitations of writing is just one of the many interesting themes that appear in that dialogue. And you find that near the end. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have the Stephanus numbers, the line numbers here in, in front of me in this uh, printed version, but it's, it's near the end of the text that you see the myth of Thuth and this discussion of writing and this kind of representational shadow reality. And, and frankly, it kind of, it relates to Plato's core philosophy about the ideal forms too, that you know, the objects in our reality are representations or shadows of some ideal form that exists somewhere, you know, that our soul came into contact with at some point. And in that same kind of allegorical vein and in, in a kind of mirror image, writing is just a representation of the actual thought, the, the real wisdom, the real truth that you have inside of your mind or something like that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.